Hello, everybody. On behalf of the Highland Park Public Library, we'd like to welcome you to Library in Your Living Room. We are pleased to present Shelf Isolation, a weekly mini series about books, culture, and what to read next. I'm Sarah Marie, and this is your Information and Reader Services Department. In this episode, we are excited to share with you what we have been reading, watching, and or listening to during Shelf Isolation. To begin our mini series, I'm going to turn things over to Reader's Roundtable expert and moderator, Michelle. Thanks, Sam Marie. I know I promised you all last time that I would talk about the book I'm reading, but that's not happening. So I'm just going to talk about today something I was super excited about. Netflix brought back one of the best shows ever, Avatar The Last Airbender. Don't know what it's about. It's the world is divided into four elemental nations the Northern and Southern Water Tribes, the Earth Kingdom, the Fire Kingdom, and the Air Nomads. The Avatar is the one that keeps the balance and they're the only ones that can master all of the four elements. So just when they need them most, the Avatar vanishes and the Fire Nation kind of takes over. So 100 years later, siblings Katara and Soka discover the new Avatar, who is named Aang. He is an airbender. So together, they must help Aang master all the elements and save the world. It is the best. If you have not seen it, I highly recommend it. It is actually a show that was on Nickelodeon, so it is fantastic for you to watch with your entire family. As I said, it's now on Netflix, but it's also on DVD. So uh, when we're back, I hope you will uh, rent the DVD and watch it with your whole family. And that's actually all that I have for today. So I'm just gonna pass it on to Stephanie. Thank you, Michelle. This week I read another Sinclair Lewis book. This one I read was Elmer Gantry. It was written in 1927 and it was a really great book. Burt Lancaster in 1960 won an Academy Award for starring as Elmer Gantry. Basically, it's a book about religious activity in America, and at this time, a lot of people were really not so fond of it. And the character in the book, he basically is like a modern-day evangelist. He starts out at a Baptist college, and he's not, he's known as Hellcat, and he's not too religious, not a very good person. And he continues not to be a good person, even though he becomes a minister and finds the pulpit. He finds his voice. And basically, the character likes to see women, likes to drink, and likes to make money. And one of the best quotes from the book is, he had, in fact, got everything from church and Sunday school, except perhaps any longing whatever for decency, kindness, and reason. And the book is written in three parts. And the first part is where he gets his calling to the pulpit. The second is where he travels around as an evangelist. And then the third part is where he moves from kind of the Baptist and the evangelist phase to the Methodist. And he's all about raising money for the church, basically to advance himself. In all three parts, women are involved and he kind of has to flee those sections from each of those. Who I highly recommend it again. The other interesting thing about the book, okay, again, it was published in 1927. It sold 240,000 copies back then and had a publishing budget, a marketing budget of $5,000. Now, he received death threats. The book was banned. Lots of things happened with this book, and he and the publisher were very smart. Anything that was said about the book, you know, like some men burned their wives' copies and things, they used that as marketing, like, Tom Smith burned his wife's book in Kansas, you know, and then read this or, you know, in Boston, churches are, you know, they're banning my book, you know. So anyway, it ended up selling all these editions. Very, very good book. I highly recommend it. Then the second thing I did this week, I listened to the podcast on Book Riot of Red and Dead. And it was the first time that I listened to it. And I really, really enjoyed it. And I highly recommend it. And on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Gus. Thank you, Stephanie. Sounds really good. So this week I wanted to do something different. I wanted to read something that I don't normally read. I don't know if it's kind of a challenge for myself. I just, I wanted to try something different. This was recommended to me by my wife who is in education. She's an early childhood uh, teacher. So she had to read a book that she said was really good and I should check it out. So that one is called The Running Dream by Wendelin Van Dranen. I thought it was really good. It's a teen book. 
And it is about a character named Jessica, who's a teenager, who is a runner. She's on the, I believe, the track team, and she's running is her whole life. And she loves it very much. And what happens is that she gets into a tragic bus accident where she loses a friend, and she also loses her right leg. So she can't run anymore. And it's a very tragic event. And it's a, it's a very, it's an emotional story. It's a good story because it talks about how she kind of overcomes it with the help and support of her family and her best friend and kind of what she goes through, you know, during that year of her life, which was, you know, a big uh, tragedy. So it was really good. It uh, came out in 2011. And if you wanted to try something different, I mean, I know I'm a teenager myself. So, you know, it was written for me, but if you want to try something different, I thought it was a really good story and I highly recommend it. Running Green by Wonderland Van Drainen. Also, I've been playing this week, I kind of had a nostalgia feeling. So I've been playing Sega Genesis Classics. This one specifically is for the Nintendo Switch. The Genesis is one of my favorite systems of all time. I grew up with it. It's weird because I'm a teenager, but anyway, <laughs> it, uh, it has a lot of good games and Sega did a great job with the classics version and it has over 50 games, like all the Sonic games. Uh, Alex Kidd is one of my favorites, but check it out. Fantasy Star, it's a, it's a great, great compilation of games. Well worth it. We do own it at the library. So if you wanted to check it out when we open, you can definitely do that. Or I highly recommend it if you do own PS4, Xbox, Nintendo Switch, well worth the money. So if you wanted to play uh, play it, go ahead and do it. On that note, I will pass it off to whoever's next. Thank you. Whoever's next. Thanks, Gus. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's Karen. So anyhow, I'm sure you all remember The Killing, you know, the, the big book I've been reading. Well, I finished. The case has been officially closed, but there are still some questions about what really happened. The female detective just can't let go of it. She's got a new theory. The book ends with our not knowing whether she will actually try to get somebody to believe the theory. In Denmark, the series went on. There were two other seasons. And I think, though, the, this is the only book that was ever written or will be written. And I may track down some other books by David Hewson, who wrote this based on the screenplay, because he has some detective novels of his own, some series, at least one series set in Italy of his own. But as I was kind of wrapping this up and deciding what I thought, I happened to go into my work tote bag to see if I had some notes on something, you know, from long ago. Haven't touched this since the library's closed. What did I discover? But the DVDs, season one of The American the remake of The Killing, complete first season. And I thought, well, you know, I, I had read some reviews that compared this favorably with the Danish version. I thought, well, what the heck? It's kind of handy. I've got it here. I really didn't even know it was there. I checked it out, I think, by mistake before I found the book. So anyhow, for the next thing, I went to my book bookshelf of library books, and I found this, uh, let's see, The Shape of Water by Andrea Camilleri. It is first Inspector Montalbano mystery. It says a novel of food, wine, and homicide in small town Sicily, but it's very tiny. I, it's, I don't know. I'll see how it goes. It looks as though it's going to be good. I've, I've gotten into chapter two. So that is, that's it for me this week, and we'll go to Sarah. Thanks, Karen. All right, so my first recommendation this week, I have another one from my 19-month-old, now that I remember that he's 19 months. I keep saying 18. This is Hug by Jez Alborough. It is adorable. There are only three words in the whole book. Hug, mommy, and bobo. It's about a little gorilla looking for his mommy because he wants a hug. And the first time I read this to Henry, he stood up like halfway through and hugged me. And it was the cutest thing ever. So definitely recommend this if you have a toddler. My next book this week was To Have and Two Hopes by Martha B. Waters. <laughs> Sarah Marie is making very happy expressions there. It's a romantic comedy set in Regency, England, and it's hilarious. It's about a couple that's already married and basically haven't spoken to each other in four years after an argument that we don't know at the beginning of the novel what the argument was about, but she decides to pretend to have consumption to get his attention and... <laughs> They basically just keep trying to one-up each other in 
fooling each other. And it's hilarious. It was just published in April. So after we all started staying at home, so the author was supposed to be on her book tour right now and is not. And the author is a librarian. So definitely recommend that one. The ebook is on Libby. My next one, this has been our family audiobook this week, is An Absolutely Remarkable Thing by Hank Green. I'd read it when it came out about a year ago and it's essentially it's a first contact story. So April May is leaving work at two o'clock in the morning, comes across a giant robot statue and thinks that it's an art installation, makes a sort of funny video about it. By the time she wakes up the next morning, it turns out there are 60 of these in different cities around the world and it's probably not human or not man-made. So it's a really fun series. It's funny, science fiction, a lot of sort of commentary about social media, and the sequel comes out in July. So I'm very excited about sequel and I'm happy to be rereading. And wanted to mention, we just decided what our next family audiobook is going to be because this is on Hoopla. The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, the Hunger Games prequel that just came out yesterday, I believe. The audiobook is on Hoopla. And speaking of things that are now on Hoopla, my last thing, I talked about this cookbook a couple weeks ago. It is now on Hoopla also. And the chicken pot pie pasta was very good. And that's it for me. And I will pass it on to Sarah Marie. Okay. Thank you so much, Sarah. This week, I'm going to talk about something I have watched. I took a gander at what else was available through Canopy's credit-free viewing and discovered something that I had actually been meaning to watch. And it is Always at the Carlisle. It is a 92-minute 2018 film directed by Matthew Neely about the Carlisle Hotel in New York. The Carlisle is one of the most glamorous hotels in New York, and worry not, the film shows plenty of interior shots that are just like chef's kiss beautiful. The Carlisle is also, however, famed for its discretion, which is all I'm going to say about that there. In addition to both of these things, the documentary features cameo appearances that are kind of a who's who of previous guests ranging from like George Clooney, my fellow St. Louis and John Hamm, um, and the late great Anthony Bourdain just to name a few. I really recommend this film. It was beautifully shot. I felt like I learned about a lot of history and most importantly it was fun. So that was one of the canopy credit-free viewing options, and I will post a link to those down in the show notes. The second bit I wish to recommend this week, and it is a little early for me to call attention to this, but I am very excited, is the fact that there is a We Are One Global Film Festival that is now going to be happening. So this sounds it's like nothing when I say it, but because film festivals cannot actually meet in person now, they're all happening virtually. So the We Are One Film Festival will allow us to watch films from Cannes, Sundance, the Toronto International, the Berlin International, Tribeca, Venice. I said it was early for me to talk about this because the We Are One Global Film Festival will be held from the 29th of May until the 7th of June on their YouTube channel, a link to which I will post below in the show notes. But for now, I'm going to turn things over to Jackie. Thank you, Sarah Marie. So this week I started reading, and I haven't quite finished it, A Gentleman in Moscow by Amar Paul. This is a wonderful book. It's basically A Gentleman in Moscow, but it starts in 1922 when Count Alexander Rostov is before a Bolshevist tribunal because he's an incurable aristocrat. Normally they probably would have taken him out and shot him, but because he wrote a poem yeah, when he was a university student that encouraged revolution, the higher-ups decided not to do that. So he was given a sentence for house arrest where he lived, which happened to be the Metropole Hotel in Moscow. This is a grand hotel that is across the street from the Kremlin, it's across the street from the Bolshevik Ballet, and he had this wonderful suite of rooms, which he actually was, had to give up, and he moved to the upper floors. And it's about his house arrest. He has this wonderful hotel to spend time with, and you think of the, the big, huge hotels that have a lot of space and restaurants, a lot of people in and out, and it's his way of it, how he is assessing this house arrest. And it's very interesting because it's also the people he befriends along the way. A couple weeks into his house arrest, he makes a comment about he feels that the hotel is getting smaller for him. But then he starts hanging out with a um, nine-year-old, Nina, who is also a resident of the hotel. 
and her governess does not want her to have to leave the building, so she has to stay in the hotel. So she shows him an Spanish version of the hotel by showing him the basement rooms and all this stuff because she has a key that can get everywhere in the hotel. So the book is about not only the council life but the life of Russian history um it begins in 1922 and I kind of went to the end to find out where the end was which is in 1954 so I didn't read the end so I'm really enjoying the book and I know a lot of Pine and Parker's read this book it's very popular and I would almost suggest if you want to reread something that you enjoyed reading this would be a perfect book to reread at this point it is available in both ebook and e-audiobook on Libby so you may want to check that out if you can. The other thing that I kind of didn't, and I didn't actually get to watch it, which was very sad for me, but the Tribune had an article, a review about Spaceship Earth, which is a documentary about the Biosphere 2. So I did check Supla and Canopy, and this documentary is not there, but I started looking through the other documentaries that are on there, and both have just this wonderful, tremendous amount of, not just, you know, popular films, but also documentaries. So you may want to check those out if you really want something else that you would want to be watching at this point. So that's sort of what I've been doing. So I'm going to turn this over to Nancy. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, this last week or two, there's been a lot of press about this book, The Plague by Albert Camus. And so I decided I've never read it. I started to delve into it again, and I'm partially through. And in addition to looking at the articles that were published this week or so, I went and looked at the original Kirkus Review from 48. And it's very complimentary, but said it never will be a popular book, but it's very good. And it's a beautifully, beautifully written book. Now, Camus' books are divided into two cycles, the cycle of the absurd and the cycle of the revolt. This is the cycle of revolt. And the protagonist, Dr. Thea, is, is kind of funny because he's like Dr. Fauci, but how you might have imagined him 50 years ago because there's scenes where he's meeting with bureaucrats, because he's seen these, this is about a plague, but we've got a plague in an Algerian city when it was still part of France. And it, it looks like a, a conference from the, now with the, the calm doctor trying to reason and the, everyone else not really getting along with that. So even though it's not part of Camus' theater of the absurd, it's absurd sometimes. And before he wrote this, Camus was a, a, law, a big user of archives. He did a lot of research about plagues, especially in northern Algeria, where he was born and lived his youth. The port, Oran, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, um, was founded essentially by pirates and then was under various empires, Spanish, Ottoman, and lastly, French before Algeria made it part of their homeland. And I think that's really reflected in this book, the accuracy of plagues and descriptions. And it starts, again, kind of a little bit left over from his absurd writing with, you know, the first scene in the book, he finds a rat and he goes, like, dead rat, what do you do with it? Not realizing this dead rat is symbolic of everything's going to be happening. So I, as I said, I have not finished it. Uh, I'm looking forward to finish it and sharing the rest next week. It's it is not available on Hoopla. However, on Hoopla, I looked, there are several study guides for the book in both French and English. We have it at the library in both French and English and electronically at the library. So talking about municipal archives, I thought I would share something about Ravinia. I'm going to try and share screen here just briefly. Oh, there you go. And this is from the Highland Park Public Archives. And it's a letter announcing the opening of Ravinia and inviting all the illuminaries to the opening in August. So, and that it is digitized, it was digitized with our previous grant and is available on the Digital Library of America and the Illinois Digital Archive under Correspondence for Government. So that's all, and I'm gonna hand it off to Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. The first thing I read is James A. Caster's Classic Scrapes, which is not at the library, but it's based off a radio show he did with a comedian called Josh Whittacom. And that is, I believe, available for free as like a podcast type thing. And even if it isn't, he has another podcast and he has a YouTube series that he does with a different comedian called Ed Gamble, where he eats puddings or desserts because Ed Gamble is a type one diabetic and can't. So James eats them while Ed Gamble stares at him. And it's really funny. And the 
The book is really entertaining. There's uh, a lot of great stories that I hadn't seen him do in his comedy yet. So I'm really enjoying that. And then something that is available at the library uh, is Year One by Nora Roberts, which just came in. I haven't actually read this yet because the hold just came in, but it was, Nora Roberts is the favorite author of one of my friends from library school. And I know this one is fantasy, which I like. So this is kind of like my compromise is, okay, I'll try her. <laughs> I know Nora Roberts is usually seen as a more like um, friendly author, but the only people that have ever asked me about this book at the libraries I work at are men. So I'm assuming it has broader appeal. Uh, we'll see when I read it <laughs> this week. And then the final thing that I've done, which is actually the reason I haven't started year one yet, is my dog got a COVID cut <laughs> because <laughs> his fur just grows. So I bought scissors and we have spent the last few days alternatively just cutting more and more of his fur off. So I don't know if you can hear the noise in the background, but he has opinions on this. <laughs> so. I've been I've been trimming his fur and it worked out surprisingly well. The groomers definitely do a better job, but in a pinch, he's no longer really hot when it's warm out and he doesn't have mats. So I count that as a success. And now I will pass this off to William. Thank you, Lisa, and good luck with the dog. So <laughs> this past week involved me trying to bake a loaf of no need bread. I have a bread maker that I've used for years, but I decided to kind of get my hands dirty after watching Jay Kenji Lopez Alt's YouTube series. For those who don't know, Lopez Alt is a restaurant owner, former member of America's Test Kitchen, former chef culinary consultant for SeriousEats.com, where he received the James Beard nomination for his blog, The Food Lab. He started this series soon after the quarantine and he was doing recipes from his restaurant but he then went on to do a video every day for the past two months where he just shows how to make one dish or another and the thing i like about it is he talks about the technique which he goes into very good detail on but he also talks about why the things in the technique works why these ingredients are involved if you can sub in another ingredient why that ingredient will work uh, I've made a couple of his recipes before. Uh, there was a cherry tomato pasta sauce, a uh, Spanish tortilla, and every time I've had much success. It's very good, and I highly recommend giving it a chance. And if you're interested, you could eventually, when we open back up, pick up Food Lab, which is a very large book with various recipes and how and why they work. So there's that. The other thing I would like to talk about is a game that I finished this past Saturday called The Outer Wild. Now, as a note, it is out for PS4, Xbox One, and you can get it on PC. There's another game called The Outer Worlds, which is also a very good game for the PS4, Xbox One, and PC that we have at the library. And if you get a chance, you should check it out. And they're both very similar in name and overall theme. They're both sci-fi that takes place in space. And that's about where they diverge. They came out at the same time. There's a lot of confusion about them, but The Outer Wilds is, you play the member of this folksy alien race that happens to have access to space flight, getting ready to do your first solo mission. And en route to getting the flight codes, you happen to be overwhelmed by something from the alien statue of the race whose space tech yours is built off, which is a good thing because soon after you go into space, your son goes supernova and everyone dies. Except for you, who comes back to the point just before you get on the ship and then you are left to figure out what you are gonna do next. You are armed with a camera, a sound detecting device, a spaceship, and your ability to remember what has happened before. The various worlds have a lot of different things going on. I spent on one world trying to run towards the center of a planet while sand was being sucked in from its moon. I spent another on another world going and discovering how 
much terra firma was not the case as the planet lived up to its name and slowly fell apart. And then there was Dark Bramble. Yikes. Anyway, it's a great game. It gives you tons of chances to feel clever, and I highly recommend it. That's Outer Wilds, not Worlds. And now I will pass it on to Lori. Thanks, Will. This past week, I have been reading Dear Edward by Anne Napolitano. It came out recently. A friend recommended it to me, and I, my hold came in on Libby, so I have been reading it. It's the story of a plane crash, basically. And there's a young man, a young, well, he's 13, I think. He's the only survivor. And it kind of runs in two tracks. One is the, the people who get on the plane, and then this boy's life after he recovers. It's really engrossing. It's really well written. The characters are, you care a lot about them, and I'm enjoying reading it. I don't know how it ends, so don't tell me. And um, I have been enjoying that book. Uh, I've also been watching on Hulu, The Great, which is a very, very fictionalized story of the life of Catherine the Great of Russia. It just veers from one minute, you're like, it's so funny and arch. And then the next minute, like someone's just gratuitously getting stabbed, you know, it's just, you're just like all over the place. It's, I'm really enjoying it. I've read a little bit about Catherine the Great. The library does have uh, the Robert Massey biography of her called Catherine the Great available on Libby. It's quite long. I have not read that. I think it's the definitive biography of her. He also wrote many other books. One really famous one was Nicholas and Alexandra. But I did read a book um, that the library owns but is not available on as an ebook called The Empress of Art by Susan Jacques. And she talks about Catherine the Great and the way that she, in real life, not in the Hulu series, although I haven't gotten to that point of the Hulu series, the way she, she collected art, and it was almost like a form of statecraft for her. And one thing that stuck with me about this was that when she overthrew her husband, Peter, and became Catherine, became the Empress, she crowned herself with this ornate crown that was valued at one-eighth of the annual Russian state budget. So uh, she just pursued uh, all sorts of art, paintings, sculptures, gems, cameos, archaeological finds, all of which, you know, became the basis for the Hermitage Museum now in Russia. So I, I'm enjoying the series, and I think I'm going to read the Massey biography next. So that's what I've been up to these days. And back to Sarah Marie. All right. Well, that is it for us today, folks. As always, please remember that we are all here for you. We are available for any comments, questions, or concerns you may have, and you can reach us online through Facebook at facebook.com slash hplibrary, through our Twitter, which is at hplibrary, or via email at hppla at hplibrary.org. So you can find this information online through our website, which is hplibrary.org. Our music today was Carefree by Kevin McLeod. You can find more information about this and the titles we mentioned and the links that we mentioned in our show notes below. Okay, everyone, this is us signing off. Until we see you next, stay safe. Bye.